So God bless all you guys for chipping in for that. We don't, uh, are you still passing a basket? Are we taking a third offering? Oh. <laughs> we haven't taken it yet? Oh, yeah, pass the baskets. Did you already pass them, Ryan? Oh, okay, this side hasn't, this side we did, this side we haven't, so go ahead. I'm sorry. Father, we thank you. Father, I thank you for everyone that was able to give a little bit to take care of the family of God. Lord, we're, we're grateful, God, that, um, that we can rob piggy banks or just take a little extra, Father, out of, our, uh, out of our week's finances to help take care of someone else in the church. And so, Lord, I thank you for every person that did that in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, Ryan, can you put the screen up? That'll bother me. I'll feel like someone's behind me. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> what is that? <laughs> Hallelujah. So how, how, many, uh, how many came out yesterday? A lot of you all came out yesterday. A little tired? I know everyone's like, man, I'm a little tired. We were out working in the, uh, there you go, working in the, uh, the park in Leroy. And I know we had a good time. Did some face painting. We popped some popcorn. We did some snow cones. Amen. Bounce houses and uh, hot dogs, and we, did a, we had a good time, didn't we? Yeah. I know Cherry asked me if there was any pictures we were going to put on Facebook. I mean, what, what, what little people we have, we didn't take any pictures. And I said, well, I said this statement, and, and I'm going to go into this in my preaching so I can explain my statement to you guys as well as to her. And God bless you for having faith. And uh, I said, well, I said it was pretty busy. I, I don't remember. I could read it off my phone. But I said it was a rather small outcome or whatever. I said, I was a little disappointed. I said, but we didn't take any pictures. And I, I said something along those lines, right? And, uh, and then she texts back to me and says, everybody that needed to be there was there. And she like sets me straight, right? Everybody that needed to be there was there. They were all blessed and God was glorified, yada, yada, yada right down the line. I said, thank you. I said, that's awesome. A good reminder. And, uh, and then we exchanged some uh, prayer requests. I said, well, I'll believe for you for this. You believe for me for this. <laughs> Sometimes we don't have faith for some things, right? And someone else might. So they'll pray for that. And, and sometimes where your faith is challenged, ask someone to pray for you, right? Now I'm going to explain why I said that to Cherry and, uh, and, and as we preach this message. And we're going to be looking at the story of Abraham and Isaac when, Isaac, or when Abraham was promised an heir. And we're going to be looking at when God asked Abraham to offer Isaac up. How many know that God, we know that he's eternal in the heavens, right? Amen? How many know that, that God moves so fast on everything that we can hardly keep up with him? Is that true? <laughs> God's speed. How many know that God takes his time with things? Which one, which one do you think is a, is, a, is a more correct answer? When God needs to do something, he's fast. When God wants something done, generally we're probably missing the mark and he's already ready to do it and he, he, you know, we're catching up to him. But when God wants to bring something to pass, he takes his time with that. You know, the prophets spoke of, of Jesus coming and they prophesied of Jesus coming some 400, 500 years before he came. And as we dig into uh, Genesis chapter 20, I think you guys can turn there. We're going to see that Abraham was promised an heir and that the nations of the world basically would be blessed through him. And we're also going to look into that story and see just how long it actually took for that to come to pass. Amen. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word, God. And we thank you that your word does not return void. And Lord, although sometimes it feels like you're distant and sometimes, God, it feels as though uh, we're always waiting sometimes on you. Your timing is perfect and precise. And so, Father, like the song we just sang, as we wait on you, Lord, we'll rise up like the eagle. And so, Father, we pray, God, that you'd help us with our patience, and, Father, that you'd help us to wait. And, Lord, we thank you that, though, that you will come to pass on our behalf. We thank you, God, that you don't forsake us nor leave us. In Jesus' mighty name, everybody said amen. We're going to take a look at Genesis 22. In a little bit. <laughs> I'm just going to share the story with you. As I was reading through the, the prior few chapters of, of the story of Abraham, I'm just going to 
that's paraphrase and, and bring that to pass. Um, Abraham was, uh, didn't have a, a house. He was a sojourner, and they were traveling around. And, and God, this is the man that God made a covenant with. This is the man that God said, through your seed, you will be the heir. Through your heir, uh, the nations will be blessed. Okay? And Abraham was about 75 years old when God first appeared to him and began to speak to him in that nature. Okay? 75 years old, and he says, your, through your seed, the nations will be blessed. Now, he, at this point, he doesn't have any descendants. He doesn't have any children. Okay, and so he's probably questioning God, but he's a little bit older. I know they lived a little longer back then, but it's still 75 years old. He's a little older, and he's going to have a child. So he believed God, the Bible says, and it was accounted to him as righteousness. Abraham is the father of our faith, or the father of faith, and he is also our father when we believe in God, and we believe in Jesus Christ who came for us. We basically are engrafted in to that family and that household of faith, which was birthed through Abraham. Does that make sense? He was the first one that God came, made covenant with, and spoke to, and he believed God, and therefore it was accounted to him as righteousness. Now, it was about 10 years later, I think Abraham was either 85 or 86 years old, still no child in sight. Sarah is not pregnant. And Sarah comes up with this idea and says, Abraham, why don't you take my maid? my maidservant. So Abraham took her and he married her, took it, her as his wife, and she conceived, and she, bore, she birthed, uh, her name was Hagar, and she birthed Ishmael. And Ishmael was the seed of Abraham, but how many know that was not the plan of God? Amen. So they have this son, and uh, he was about 86 years old, and so now, now he's got his first offspring. And God appears to him again, and he says, he says, no. He says, through your seed, not this one. He had to correct him. He said, hold on now. He said, through Sarah and you. Through Sarah and you. And at this point, Abraham you know, was getting a little bit discouraged, would we not? Ten years in. Okay, wouldn't we all get a little, naturally, we'd all get a little bit discouraged. But now here God comes again, encouraging him again. And it says that he chuckled a little bit. So the years go on, but he believed God. But he chuckled a little bit. <laughs> so the years go on, and it says that when Abraham was 99 years old, 99, still no Isaac, Sarah still not pregnant, no heir yet through Sarah and Abraham, Guys, this is 24 years after God began to speak to him. The angel appears and, and is talking to him, and, and it says that Sarah was hiding behind the wall of a tent, and he's speaking to, to, to Abraham, and he's telling him, about this time next year, Sarah shall conceive or be with child. And it says that Sarah behind the wall of the tent, she chuckled, <laughs> and she laughed. And the angel says that to Abraham, why'd she laugh? And then, and then it says that Sarah said, I didn't laugh because she was scared. And he says, yes, you did laugh. And so he questioned him. And so the time goes on. Well, the time comes to pass, and guess what? They have a baby. And Isaac is now born. So now the promise that God spoke to Abraham when he was 75 years old, he's now about the ripe old age of 100. And he laughed at one point, and Sarah laughed at one point, and her womb was dead. Okay. And what the angel said to Sarah was, is, 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 every, is, is, is this impossible for the Lord? Is this, in, is anything, is what he said, is anything impossible for the Lord? So, stand corrected, the baby comes, and now they're beginning to walk and fulfill the promise. It says, on the eighth day they circumcised Isaac, and that was the covenant that God had with Abraham, circumcision. Amen? And so, the child began to grow. And it's going to lead us into the story that we're going to read now about Abraham asking God, or, or excuse me, God asking Abraham to take Isaac up to the mount to offer him up as a sacrifice. Are you, no. got a question? or Something flying, by. Something flying by. I don't know, was it an angel or a bug? It was a bug. Okay. Hallelujah. Angel. How many people have, uh, have ever gotten discouraged waiting on God? One. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. 
All right, it's almost all of us. Listen, I guarantee you, and I'm going to say this with boldness, that if you're living a life with God and you're walking with him and you're reading his word and you're praying and you have this relationship, you will at one point in your walk with God get discouraged waiting on him. Because one thing that I know is that God is eternal in the heavens, which I started this thing with, and he can outweigh all of us. Okay? That's for sure. The second thing is, is that God really is not in a hurry to bring things to pass. 25 years ago, we uh, were fairly new in the church, fairly new in the Lord. Uh, you might have been going to church with us, the same one in San Diego, when Dr. Barclay called us out and began to prophesy over us that we would feed the sheep, that we would stand with the feed in our hands and we would ask the man of God where to spread it and he would show us where to spread it and we would feed the sheep and we would beat off the wolves and it was a long, glorious prophecy. And man, not only did it, did, it, did it, I tell you, when you get a word like that, it sets you on fire, sets you ablaze, and you're like, wow, right away we got into Bible college. And man, I remember being in Bible college and, you know, thinking that we were something great because God spoke about us, you know, and we're going to be these preachers. And I remember the first time I got up to preach and I couldn't talk because I was so full of pride in myself. I got up there, <laughs> I, couldn't find the, I couldn't find the passages, I couldn't find the books. I was just left there, and, and, and God does that. God speaks to you. It encourages you. Prophecy is for edification, for building up. He speaks about the future. And then he says, okay, now, now run with it, son. Now run with it, son. And a word like that, man, I'm telling you, it'll, it'll build your, boost your ego. So now he's got to spend the next 24 years deflating that. Well, God will wait. He will outweigh you. So I, I'm sharing this message because I'm preaching to her and me today. So if you happen to get something out of this, Good, because sometimes we come to church, and I know I'm speaking to you fine people. Sometimes I come to church, and I might be preaching about the church at large. Sometimes I might be preaching about this or that. But today, I'm just preaching to her and me. But if you can catch something out of this, then more power be unto God and to you. Going back to my saying when I talked to Cherry yesterday, and I said, well, I said it was kind of a sad amount of people that came out yesterday. See, the reason that I said that, the reason that I allowed the circumstances to dictate my faith or how I spoke, is because I have a vision up here, and I have a dream in my heart. And see, and God has shown me through prophecy, and he has shown me through dreams, and he's shown me through vision of what this church is capable or what it's going to be, and it's not there yet. And if we're not careful when we go out doing the right things with the right motives and with the right heart, and it doesn't quite look the way that you want it to look, or that you think it's supposed to look, it can discourage you. See, if we're not careful, we can try to make the plans of God come to pass prematurely, like Abraham did with Ishmael. In our own flesh, we can try to help along the plan of God. Right? I was reminded by the Lord this week, he said, did, did the word originate with you? Or was it my word? Kind of an easy answer, right? I didn't prophesy over myself. The word didn't come from me, didn't come from man. The word came from God. That means that God's word will not return void, but will accomplish. Not God's word will be accomplished by Jason or by Michelle. Does that make sense? God's word will carry it out. Does that mean we sit around waiting and wait on the Lord and we'll rise up like the eagle? Does that mean we just sit like this in a corner? We're not going to do anything. We're going to wait on God. We're not going to do anything. We're just going to wait on God. And when he says, God told us to go, right? God told us to go out and do outreaches. And therefore, that's what we're doing. He's testing our obedience. He's also blessing people. Because everyone that came out that needed to be out there got blessed. She's right. Not only that, when I talked to Maureen and I talked to all you individuals, you're like, man, I talked to so many people. I had a great time. I got blessed. Meanwhile, I'm just doing snow cones, and I go home like, man, that was just really no one there. You know, and, and, and so in my vision, it was about, I saw this much of this. Is this making sense? But everyone else, they didn't see it that way. They had a great time. They got blessed. Those people got blessed. And God's plan, whatever it is that he's doing, is coming to pass. Another great story, you know, when you look through the Old Testament and you, you begin to look at the fathers of faith and you begin to look through the, the, the heroes, I think it's Hebrews chapter 12, the heroes of faith, and it starts listing all the people, Gideon and Barak and, 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 and Samson and, and Noah and, and Moses and, and all these people we're talking about. 
How about Moses? Moses grows up as a baby. They were killing all the babies. He gets sent into Pharaoh's house. Pharaoh's own daughter raises Moses. Okay? By the time Moses is a young adult, Moses knows that those are his countrymen. He knows that those are his people. And he also knows that he has been called to set them free. And it says that he would go out and he would see those people and his heart would break and he would hurt for them. And one day, Moses went out and decided, I'm going to do this on my own strength, in my flesh. And he slayed an Egyptian and hid the body. And it says that when he did that, his own people turned against him because then Pharaoh made it harder on them. He actually made it harder on them. And then he was banned out to the wilderness. Where Moses would spend the next 20 years learning not to try to make God's plan come to pass in his own strength, right? To the point probably even that Moses sort of began to forget about his calling until he saw that shiny bright light up in the mountain. <laughs> oh, look, something shiny. And he ran up to see what it was, and it was a burning bush, a bush that was on fire but was not consumed. And God spoke to him there and says, Guess what, Moses? You are going to go see Pharaoh. And by this time, Moses says, Oh, no, I'm not. <laughs> no, no, I'm not. I've been there. I've done that. I've tried. And if I could hear this conversation, I'm sure God would be like, no, 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 Moses, you tried in your own might, in your own strength, and you tried to do it your way. But now this time, Moses, I am sending you, and I'm going before you. And I know that's how the conversation went, because then Moses said, who shall I say sent me? He said, you tell them I am sent you. Well, what if they don't believe me? I mean, this is how much doubt he had. What if they don't believe me that I am sent you? Take this rod. Throw it down, and it'll turn into a snake. So God gives him all this stuff. So here's a man then goes into Egypt. God does what he says he's going to do. And over time and all the, uh, the plagues that happened to the Egyptians, he lets the Israelites go. And then they come out and then they, they do what? They wander in the wilderness. They bad talk. They're, 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 they're angry. They're, they'd rather go back to Egypt and die in slavery because now they're wandering around. God's feeding them manna every day. Now we want meat. And they're complaining. They're whining. And because of that, they spent 40 years wandering in the wilderness. You're going to deliver my people, Moses. And then he delivers them, and he's like, this is not what I thought it was going to be, Lord. <laughs> I came to help these people, and all they do is whine, snibble, and complain. Now I've got to spend 40 years in the wilderness walking around in circles with them. <laughs> See, God's plan is huge far outreaching our wildest imaginations. This church and what God's calling it to be could happen in 110 years from now. Let's chew on that a little bit. <laughs> this is awesome what we got going on, but I mean, what, what, what I feel like God, what he told us and what he said, are we dead? No. It could happen 200 years from now. The story we're reading right now, before Isaac came, God spoke to him and said, Abraham, he said, this is the covenant I'm going to make, and your, your people are going to be multitudes upon multitudes, and they're going to grow. He says, in fact, he says, they're going to go into captivity in a land that's foreign to them. He says, and they're going to multiply there. He says, and then I will deliver them out of there with a mighty hand. He's telling them about the Moses story. They spent 400 years there in bondage. 400 years in bondage. But God said so that they might multiply. There's scholars that say that, uh, maybe the word says, but I've heard scholars say they were 1.2 1, 1 million people when they came out of, out of Egypt. That's the multiplying right there. But God spoke about that before the, the 25 years of waiting for Isaac. How do you think Abraham felt? And in the middle of all of that, Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed. And God took Abraham and he said, after all, you are the father of this nation that's going to be birthed through you. I might as well share with you what I'm doing over here. And that's where Abraham pleaded with God. If there was 50 righteous men, would you save Sodom? If there was 40 righteous men, 30, 20, 5, and there was none. And God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. And he showed Abraham. Now, 99 years old, 100 years old, Abraham tried to bring it to pass. Moses tried to bring it to pass in his time. We've all tried to bring things to pass in our time. I know that through the years of 
living out that prophetic word. We've started Bible studies. We've done jail ministries. None of this stuff was in vain. None of it was wrong. But God was doing things through it. But it wasn't what he called us to. And then we start this church at the voice of a prophet saying, green light, go. It's time to start a church. And that's the cool thing because we had no jobs. We had nothing. And, and we kind of, we sort of at, our, at that time in our life said, we kind of give up on that calling. And it's usually when you're about give up on something, God's like, all right, now it's time to use you, man. He's because you're out of the way and now I can come through, right? So then we start this church. I know, Lord, that it's going to explode, man. I know I have the word and what I've been waiting and how I've been praying. And I know that mm, groves of people, they're going to come from San Diego to this church. You know, they're just going to be huge. <laughs> I, and in my imagination, as we were building up to the launch date of March 17, 2000, and whatever, 13, I think it was, and I'm stripping and waxing floors at the Y in the middle of the night, and man, I was in tears, worship music going, I'm like, wow, God, this is going to be amazing. Now, two and a half years later, <laughs> God is still breaking us and humbling us. And he'll do that until we die. Because the purpose of this church or the ministry, the school that we will have one day, the apostolic, yeah. How about Dr. Russ when he comes? This will be an apostolic center for the nation, a, 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 a prototype. We were the other day last week before I started studying this, and I said that to her, and we both started belly laughing. I said, yeah, how's that going to happen? <laughs> we're just rolling. This is your pastor's telling you the truth now. What happened to Abraham when God finally, after so many years, he belly laughed. Sarah hid behind a tent wall and said, yeah, right, that ain't going to happen. <laughs> we did last week before I even started reading this. We were laughing. I'm like, how is that going to happen? But is this impossible for our God? No. Is it about her and me? No. no. Is it about you? No, no it is about, it's about Sam. <laughs> we know that Sam's got some more breaking to do, Lord, so... Yeah. <laughs> Put them in alignment with us. But I know that you two also are living out a prophetic word about being a, yep. a healing ministry from church to church and whatever the whole word is, right? So you feel for us because you guys have come alongside of us also and you've said, oh, we're elders now. And, you know, I'm just, this may not be how you're thinking, but I'm going to pretend. So now you're elders and, and you've got this oil we bought from Israel. Oh, man. And so we call you guys up and you guys lay hands and, you, and, you, and you're anointing people and you're praying for the sick and you've gone to the hospitals and, and you've done these things. And I know that you have not seen a cripple jump out of a wheelchair yet. Not yet. Not yet. But I also know that that's the, the, the prophetic word that went into their hearts. And as they're waiting on the Lord, they too shall rise up like the eagle. Isaiah. 4031, that verse is going between them candles, by the way. So every day we can walk in and we can go, <laughs> we can laugh and then say, those that wait on the Lord. Right? Every one of us, God has spoken to about something. It doesn't matter how big or small it is. We're all waiting on Jesus to return, too. But all this stuff takes years, and God's working it out. Let's read this chapter. Starting in verse 1. Now it came to pass, chapter 22. After these things, that God tested Abraham. And he said to him, Abraham. And he said, here I am. And he said, take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on the one of the mountains in which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey, and he took the two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son, and he split the wood and burnt offerings, and he arose and he went to the place which God told him. Then on the third day Abraham lifted his eyes and saw a place far off. And Abraham said to the young men, Stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship, and we will come back to you. Do you guys catch that? Abraham, take this your only son. And take him to Mount Moriah and offer him up as a burnt offering. Now, let me back up and remind you guys of something, okay? I'm backing up. 
Ten years into the promise of God speaking to him that he would be the father of many nations and that the nations of the world will be blessed through Abraham, Sarah came along and said, hey, take my maidservant, go into her. And they tried in their own flesh to make their own destiny come to pass. They tried to give God a helping hand. Amen? Anybody ever done that? Fifteen years after that, an angel stood before them both and says, you will have a child. They laughed. Twenty-five years. So it's interesting that the Bible doesn't tell us in between like, what was going on. How much conversation do you think they had? How much conversation do you think he had with God? When, Lord? Oh, when, oh, God. You know, you, we, we read these guys and we think they just walked in faith, you know, like a spear towards a target. <laughs> They're just solid, man. They're not like us. No, they're just like us. All the questions we ask, they were asking. Believe me, I know they were because they were human like we are. And then it says that he was a lad. Isaac was weaned. Some scholars believe that he had to be at least older than four, but he could be as old as 31 years old. We don't know. But he was old enough, as we'll read, to carry the wood, and to ask the question, where's, where's the offering? Where's the, okay, let's go on. On the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes. Where were we, guys? Abraham took the wood, verse 6, of the burnt offering. He laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and the two of them went together. But Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, my father. And he said, here I am, my son. And he said, look, I see the fire. <laughs> I see the wood, I'm carrying it, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, my son, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering. So the two of them went on together. Already we see Abraham with two faith statements. You two wait here with the donkey. We're going to worship the Lord. We will be back, Abraham said. Right here he says, God will provide this burnt offering. Then they came to the place of which God had told him, and Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order, and he bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Isaac, or Abraham stretched out his hand, and he took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, Here I am. And he said, Do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God. And since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. Then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a ram caught in the thicket by, the, by his horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it as a burnt offering instead of his son. Abraham called the name of the place, the Lord will provide. And it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. I like this. Let's keep going. And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time out of heaven, and he said, By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son. Blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore. And your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to his young men, and he rose and went together to Beersheba, and Abraham dwelt in, in Beersheba. Now it came to pass after these things that he was told, Abraham saying, indeed, okay, we'll stop there. Listen to that. Blessing, I will bless you. Your descendants shall possess the gates of their enemies. Who is Abraham's descendants? You. We. We're going to read in a verse in a second that, yes, God multiplied the Israelites. Yes, God multiplied his seed through Isaac. And they became numerous as the sand on the seashore and as the stars in heaven. But as merely that was just a, a, a natural reflection of what God was actually speaking of there. He shall, be his, he shall be a blessing to the nations. He was speaking of Christ who would come eventually through the bloodline and through the lineage of Isaac, who now through faith we have all been engrafted in and have become children of the Most High God. By faith, 
God has accounted it to us as righteousness, just as he did to Abraham when he believed God. You catching this? And we are his children. And we possess the gate of our enemy because of what Christ did for us. He said, I will bless you. All the nations shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. What is that verse, guys? Help me out. And the gates of hell will not prevail. Upon this rock I will build my church. That's what, that's what he said. Upon this rock I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Upon the revelation of who Jesus was. Because in that verse right there, it says, Who do you say that I am? Jesus asked him. And he said, Some say that you're a prophet. Some say that you're a teacher. And they went on this whole list. But he said, But who do you say that I am? And Peter rose up and said, Thou art the Christ, Son of the living God. He said, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood did not reveal this, but my Father who is in heaven has revealed this to you. He said, I call you Peter, which means little rock. And upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Upon the revelation of who Jesus is in the heart of man, by the revelation of the Holy Spirit, that's the gates, that's the church that he's building that the gates of hell shall not prevail against. A fulfillment of that prophecy right there, some hundreds of years before. And if you look at it in our time, when we give our hearts to Christ and the Holy Spirit comes in, we literally are still fulfilling the word that God gave Abraham 25 years before Isaac was even born. That prophetic word that the nation shall be blessed is still coming to pass until the fulfillment of the times. Amen? So get this. 25 years he waited. And now Isaac's at least 5 years old. Isaac could possibly be 30 years old. So let's do the math. That's at least 30 years that, that, that Abraham waited for the fulfillment of the word to see the prophetic word literally incarnate. He waited 25 years to see the fulfillment of Isaac born. And now Isaac's walking. And now Isaac's got sticks on his back. <laughs> because Isaac's being offered up as a sacrifice. It says that Abraham believed, had so much faith, that he knew that even if he killed Isaac, that God would raise him back up again. All right, Lord. If you want me to lay down the promise... I know you'll raise it back up again because you spoke this thing into existence. I didn't. Now, if it was Ishmael, it might have been a different story. Abraham might have been like, oh, Lord, Ishmael, you're done. <laughs> because God didn't speak Ishmael into existence. But see, because of the weight, because of the tuning, the fine tuning of Abraham, because God was tweaking him, and getting him out of the way and teaching him to wait upon the Lord. What does that scripture say? That those that wait upon the Lord, they shall renew their strength, mount up on wings like eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not grow faint. Abraham waited. Now, he may not have waited patiently because I certainly don't wait patiently either. Sometimes I get a little upset. Sometimes I get angry. Sometimes I have anxiety. Sometimes I say, why, God? I scream at God sometimes. I know it's only me, right? Okay. <laughs> do your kids ever do that? Do they ever get mad at their parents? Why? I want ice cream. You know, whatever it may be, right? <laughs> I mean, do kids do that? Are we not children of God? Do we not get a little upset with God? Do we not pout, go into the corner and sit down? Meanwhile, God's like, eh, he'll come around. Make him wait a little longer. That's right. <laughs> no, Lord, don't make me wait. I titled this message, Aligning Your Destiny. Because we have a tendency as human beings, and I think it's natural, to not only be impatient with God, because we are stuck in this thing called time, Promised maybe 70 to 90 years. I don't know what they say we're actually promised. God, eternal in the heavens, has all the time in the world. In fact, he has so much time, he's not in time. Only we're in time. God did this. 
and Isaac was on the scene. Abraham, you, through your seed, you're going to have an heir, and, and the nations are going to be blessed. And then he was there. To God, that's probably what it felt like, because he's in eternity. To us, we're like, when, God? And we tend to have a tendency to want to try to help God along sometimes. <laughs> and then we birth Ishmael's. Isn't Ishmael, because God blessed him and said, I'll make him a great nation also, because Abraham prayed for him. I'll make him a great nation also. Now, isn't Ishmael the, the tribe or whatever you want to call it that's against Israel now today, uh, the, the Muslims? Sometimes in our impatience and not waiting on God, we literally can birth our own enemies. Because we tried or thought that God needed a help in hand, maybe. God needs a help in hand. He's taken so long. Maybe, maybe our hearts are right. Maybe we're like, oh, Lord, this, this has happened to me. I'm just sharing today, so enjoy, relax. Maybe our hearts are right, and we're like, Lord, we know the promise says this, so should we go do this, this, or this? And, and our hearts are right. We want to help people, right? We want to do what's best. We want to try to make this thing. But it's not like we're trying to make something happen, but we are kind of. So we go out and we, we do something for the Lord, and we do some kind of ministry or outreaches, which are good. They're, they're blessing and reaching a lot of people. But listen, I see, I see an outreach where people come by the multitudes to hear about the word of the Lord. They hear about the healings, like when Jesus walked the earth. And they're being touched, and people are coming out of wheelchairs. And it's not just about bounce houses and snow cones. It's about Jesus, and it's about healing, and it's about eternal life. I see multitudes coming to get a touch from God and God actually be in there because sometimes it feels like he's not there in fullness because the fullness of the time is not there. God showed up just when he needed to 25 years after he told Abraham here comes Isaac and then 5 to 20 years after that however long it is he says now I want you to kill it. <laughs> Wait a minute Lord what are you talking about? Because I have heard it preached nine ways from Sunday that we can birth Ishmael's and get in the way of God's plan, right? I just sort of gave you that message. If we can get impatient and we can try to help God along. But I have to believe from what I've experienced and what I'm reading that even after Isaac comes, with good intentions, we can still get in the way and try to help God out. And I believe that Abraham probably was doing that with Isaac. Probably overprotective. I mean, he waited, man, he waited 25 years, guys. He probably was, I don't even know, I don't have words, he, he, but I'm sure that he was probably pouring into Isaac all that he thought Isaac would be because of what God had told him over 25 years. I'm sure, like us, in this ministry, in this church, we expect more and we, and we see more in our hearts and in our minds and in our visions and, and we can over get involved. That's the best way I can explain it. Trying to make things happen. And now you can bring this right down to the little promises that God has given us in our lives. Perhaps your son or daughter, is, God's promised you they'll be saved or Chris is going to come out of a wheelchair and yet you sit waiting and we sit waiting. Is it not natural for us to want to get involved a little bit too much? And God says, look, take Isaac, take him to the mount. I want you to sacrifice him there. Abra it doesn't, Abraham didn't even flinch. Got up in the morning, chopped up some wood, grabbed him. Because I think Abraham at that point, I mean, whether he got a little angry at God, you know what, Lord, you promised this son to me? You told me at 25 years, Lord, I waited for this one? You know what? I know, Lord, that even if I have to offer him up as a burnt offering, God, I know that you will raise him back up, and guess what? He's coming back down that mount with me. So I hear chopping wood. He was probably getting bitter. God, I can't believe you would, you know, <laughs> human. can't believe you'd ask me of this. But nonetheless, not my will, your will. I called it realigning your destiny. Because sometimes we get in the way. And when we lay it down, 
on the altar of sacrifice, not only can God say to us, okay, Abraham, now I know you fear me. Okay, Jason, Sam, Judith, whoever, now I know that you fear me. But we've laid it down and we've said, Lord, it's in your hands again. Because God, this thing, it didn't originate with us. This church building, Isaac, it all was birthed out of your word. Forgive me for trying to make something happen. Forgive me, God, for now waiting patiently upon you and trying to rush something along. So this day, God, I don't shut the doors and walk away because surrendering is not quitting. Surrendering is realignment with God's plan and his purpose. We lay EFF Church on the altar of sacrifice because we know that even if we did shut the door and burn this place down, that if it was God's word, he'll raise it back up again. We know that it wasn't our plan. We know that it wasn't our idea. We know that 25 years ago, this thing was spoken of by God through the prophets. And this is his word coming to pass. And so we lay it down, God. So that it can be realigned with your plan and with your purpose. Because it didn't originate with us, God. It originated with you. And your word will not return void, but will accomplish that which it was sent forth to do. Abraham said, Isaac may be from my loins, but he's from your word. And I lay him down because he is yours. And this plan that you have for him, though I think it's this big, Abraham had to have no idea how big it really was. None. How big was it? Romans 4, please. Verse 1 through 8. What then shall we say that Abraham our father has found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. Just as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. Hallelujah. So if it's something that Abraham did in his own strength, in his own works, if it was that, it says that if he worked for it, then he would be owed some money. He'd be owed some payment. But he didn't work for it. He believed God. And because he believed God in faith, it was accounted to him as righteousness. And he became the father of us all because he believed God. And then reading down to, starting in verse 13 through 21, it says, For the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. And if those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made void. And the promise made of no effect. Because the law brings about wrath. For where there is law, there is no, or excuse me, for where, no, for where there is no law, there is no transgression. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be according to grace, so that the promise might be sure to all the seed. Not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations in the presence of him whom he believed, God, who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did, who contrary to hope, in hope, believed so that he became the father of many nations according to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. There was a controversy going on here between the righteousness of the law versus the righteousness of faith. And I just want to just remind us of one thing that we seem to overlook all the time. That when Abraham had made covenant with God, or I should say when God made covenant with Abraham, he made a covenant based 
on belief. He made a covenant based on faith. He said, this will happen, and Abraham believed him at his word. And it was a covenant forever birthed in faith. Then some four or five hundred years later, God gave the law. And even right here, they were tripped up between the law and grace. Law or faith. Works, faith. Works, faith. And Paul goes on to explain, it's not by works, but it's by faith that it might be according to grace. And we get hung up sometimes, well, we're not under the Old Testament. We're not under the old, the law, the letter of the law. We're under the New Testament or grace. Let me remind you that before the law and before the New Covenant, I'll say it this way, before the Old Testament and the New Testament or the law and grace, that there was a covenant that was made with the Father or the one who would be the heir and that would be the blessings to all the nations through Christ. The one in whom we believe, we become heirs also in the kingdom of heaven because of Christ because Abraham believed and it was accounted to him for righteousness that there was a covenant of faith long before the law ever came we don't need to get caught up on grace versus the law what we need to know is that our father Abraham believed God so that now we can believe God whether we're Jew or Gentile whether we're of the law or whether we're under grace, we believe God. Amen? Amen. And the scriptures say in Psalms 34, 37, 4, that we should delight ourselves in our God. Let's look at that real quick. We'll close with it. Psalms 37, 4. I'll just read it to you. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. The desires of our heart may be all the things we talked about today. Maybe the fulfillment of this ministry. Maybe the desires of Abraham's heart might have been Isaac finally coming on the scene. But if we're not careful, we can get caught up on wanting to see that manifest. It's a good time to sing a song because the child's crying. <laughs> but if we delight ourselves in our God and not worry about the word coming to pass, not worry about... You know, you guys have heard me, you guys have had to help me through this over the last so many months. Well, numbers, numbers, numbers. We've talked about it, and, and, and people will tell me, it's not about numbers, Pastor Jason. But you, I wanted you to understand why I get caught up on that sometimes. Because I see this. But then down here, all I see is this. And if I'm not careful, I can try to help it along. And what God's telling me to do, like I said, I was preaching us, delight ourselves in Him, and then He'll give us the desires of our heart. Amen. I don't need to make this thing happen. We don't need to try to build the church. We don't need to try to add numbers to the church. In fact, last week we, read, we, we, we went over some of the prophecies and we laughed. <laughs> really? Like Abraham and Sarah did. Do you know what Isaac's name means? Laughter. So in their laughter, and they're thinking that it couldn't happen, it happened, so they named their kid Laughter. The promise. Closing with Isaiah 40, 31, that those that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. Amen? Amen. That's our verse. I said, every week I say, why did we put that verse, attach it to this ministry? We didn't, he did. Wait. God, you know that old expression, hurry up and, hurry up and wait? That's us. Hurry up and wait. We're ready, Lord. Let's do it. Nope, hurry up and wait. All right, Sam, we're going to hit a song. We'll close with this song. We'll all stand, we'll sing it together, it's not that long. And then have a blessed week waiting on the Lord. We'll wait on the promises of God. You know why? Because our God is able.